Hello everyone, it's Menemberg with our third part of the long essay question series. We are diving into the most important point on the rubric. Now, it might help you to have your rubric handy because we're going to walk through this and kind of unpack what it looks for in this particular point. In our previous videos, however, if you haven't watched them, I go through how to break down an LEQ prompt and I talk about how to structure an LEQ essay. Worth checking out if you have a few minutes. In this one, we're going to build on that and hopefully by doing so, you're going to do better on the LEQ overall. So let's dive in. We're looking at the thesis, the argument, the main core of your long essay question. Without this, your best chance is two out of six on this rubric. And my friends, I don't know about you, but I think we can do better than that. National average doesn't include a thesis, generally speaking, so we're just going to aim a little bit higher and hopefully get this point. Okay, so first let's start with what it should be. All right, a specific argument that answers the prompt, that answers the question. Nothing more, nothing less. Where does it go? It goes, it's one to two sentences at the end of the first body paragraph. You don't have to put it there, you should put it there. I'm advising you to put it there, so hear me when I say that. But it also might come at the end. Remember, if you're looking at that rubric, which you are, of course, because you listen to what I say, it says those are the only two places they should find it. Beginning paragraph, ending paragraph. Nowhere else. That doesn't mean you're not making your argument throughout. That just means they aren't looking for it there. So make sure to put it in one of those two spots. Okay, remember, the conclusion only needs to be there if you've neglected to put it at the beginning or the one that you put at the beginning isn't your best shot and you want to kind of restructure, reframe it at the end, that's the one they'll count, okay? All right, how to write a thesis statement. In your first intro paragraph, you're gonna do two sentences, like I said, one to two. You're gonna include the time period, right? They give it to you in the prompt, show them that you saw that, okay? You're also gonna include the geographical region, the theme, or think pieces, right? Maybe, maybe more than one theme, but probably stay with one theme, okay? Historical thinking skill. Remember, causation, comparison, co change in continuity over time. De develop the language to put that in your thesis statement and then you're going to be in good shape. Historically defensible claim that establishes a line of reasoning. We're going to spend most of our time on this last part. These ones should be relatively self-explanatory. I go into a little bit more detail when I in that first video when we break down some prompts. So let's spend time here. But just as a clarification, will you be graded down if you don't include these items? Maybe not. Probably not, but I'm raising the bar. I'm setting a standard that you can be very sure that you're getting this point. These are check marks that you should have mentally or maybe even on the paper while you're writing it that you know that you have all of the necessary ingredients to get that thesis point. Okay, this part though is absolutely critical because this is the exact language from that rubric that you're looking at right now. Okay, so the first part, has acceptable thesis. Remember, acceptable is a subjective term. That means what you deem as acceptable may not be acceptable to somebody else. For example, if I wash the dishes by hand, I may think they're clean, but Mrs. Menenberg may come along and say, you know what, they're not really clean at all. We need to redo that. The same way, acceptable thesis, subjective. Depends on who's looking at it. So you gotta look at what they, the reader, are looking for, okay? So what's not acceptable? What's not acceptable is a restatement of the prompt into a statement rather than a question, okay? I'm not saying don't use the language of the prompt. I'm simply saying that's not sufficient because guess what? They already have that. They don't need you to repeat it. But more than that, it's not an argument. Another thing that's not acceptable is a split thesis. This is where you have one sentence here and one sentence there put them together, there's some other stuff in between, but you, if you take them out and put them together, they make a thesis. Don't make the reader hunt down your thesis. Don't make them try to figure it out. This is not a riddle, my friends. This is very analytical and it's very uh, kind of formulaic writing. It's not your fancy English writing. I apologize if that's where you're trying to go, but we wanna be very simple, we wanna be straightforward, we wanna be easy to follow with our thesis. Put it in one place, put those sentences together, you're gonna be in good shape, okay? A thesis addresses the prompt. These are in quotes, by the way, because this is taken directly from the College Board rubric. Just keep that in mind. Okay, remember, tons of accurate information plus wrong topic or misunderstanding the prompt equals a zero. You guessed it, my friends. I could have all of the great knowledge in my head of history 
And if I misread that prompt, or I misunderstand it, or I don't exactly address all the parts, I'm getting zero. They don't care, okay? They ask a question, they want an answer to that question, not your question that you made up. I once had a student, this is a fun story for me and not them, uh, who didn't see the way the format of the paper was, the, the, the question, the prompt was at the very, very bottom, and they didn't see that. So they just made up their own prompt and wrote an essay for it. Do you think I gave them points? No, because I'm mean, and that was wrong of me. All right, you also wanna look for familiar words, and I want you to think about those synonyms to historical thinking skills. I showed you this in our videos about historical thinking skills. I showed you them about the themes. Go back and watch those videos at a later time. You'll get a good review there. But you want to look for those words within the prompt so that you can address them and put them back into your thesis. Okay? Another thing you need to do to address the prompt, you do not want to answer more than you're asked to do. Okay, so here's an example. If the prompt asks you to discuss Christianity, Buddhism, or Hinduism, pick one. Just one. When you see that word or, that means you have a choice. It doesn't mean you have to do them all. How many times I've seen students tackle all three of those things when they only needed one or maybe two? It's a waste of time, my friends. It's not just a waste of time. What generally happens when you do that is your essay is going to have very thin evidence and a lot of it related to, you know, each one of these, or maybe, no, excuse me, not a lot, a little bit of it related to each of these topics. It's not going to be enough for evidence, but it's going to be a lot more difficult to substantiate your, your, your claim, your thesis there, okay? Don't do it. Pick what you need to and focus there, okay? All right. It also has to have a historically defensible claim slash thesis. Okay. This is some tricky language, all right? Because again, if you're an English writer, you've just given some general statements in your thesis statements for your English papers. This is not what we're looking for. We are looking for you to make an argument. In order for something to be an argument, there has to be some possibility of what? Disagreement, okay? So, includes two things. Like I said, arguable. That means smart people could disagree with you. That doesn't mean Every smart person is going to disagree with you because in that case, you're wrong. But there's generally two, maybe three sides to this argument, okay? That's the idea there with that term arguable. In addition, it has evidence. In other words, history backs you up. Okay, so here's an example from Song China. If you made the argument that women were on equal footing, uh, no pun intended, socially in Song China to men, that's arguable. But nobody is going to take that position because it's historically indefensible. So that word defensible means you've got to be able to back that up, okay? It's got to be substantiated by evidence. And that's going to be the rest of your essay, right? Okay? Questions so far? Write them in the comments. Keep them coming, people. Next, establishes a line of reasoning. This is something that many people ignore. This is, all things, this is something a lot of teachers ignore. But let me focus on it for a second because it's in the language of the rubric. You gotta pay attention because again, this is what the reader wants. They wanna see this. Line of reasoning is basically a roadmap to your essay or why you have taken your position. Why your position is legit, okay? It should be two things. One, it sets the parameters of the essay within time, location, who's involved, etc. But it also, gives basic reasons for your claim. Now, this doesn't mean you should list all of your evidence. Remember, that's what your body paragraphs are for. But it should include some basic reasons for your claim. You know, because of X, Y, and Z, or as seen in X, Y, and Z, this is more or less why I'm taking this position, right? Okay, again, the X, Y, and Z, this goes back to English teaching, will become the topic sentences of your body paragraphs. And your body paragraphs will have tons more detail about those, those general categories, okay? The general categories of what we're doing with this line of evidence, or line of reasoning, rather. We're, we're establishing what we are gonna be talking about in that essay. All right, so here's a sample format that I like to teach my students. Remember, there's a low bar and there's the Menenberg bar. We're aiming for the Menenberg bar here, so if you, if you target this, this format, you're probably gonna get that point as long as you're addressing the prompt and you're addressing all the other things that I mentioned before. Okay, here's what it's gonna look like. First, in the time period X, 
excuse me, in, in this time period, X led to Y and Z. However, Y was more significant than Z because of A, B, and C. That sounds like algebra. It's not. Let me give you, let me fill in those blanks for you. Between 1750 and 1900, there were many social effects of the Industrial Revolution, including the broadening of the middle class and a rise in feminist movements. However, the rise in feminist movements was more significant because it fundamentally shifted the structure of Western culture. Now, for those of you paying attention, I didn't do an A, B, and a C. I did like an A. Right, But you can see the basics are there. The, 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 the structure is sound. It gives you a line of reasoning because, right, that because is that line of reasoning. And I have my parameters. I'm going to be talking about the broadening of the middle class and I'm going to be talking about feminist movements as an effect of, a social effect, excuse me, of the Industrial Revolution. The reader knows where I'm going. I know where I'm going. And it's going to be something that I could substantiate with evidence. And somebody else may disagree and they may say, you know what, it was the broadening of the middle class that was a more significant effect. And they could make that case as well. Similar evidence might show up, but the argumentation is right there. Okay, the thesis, the groundwork, the roadmap is right there. It's defensible, it's historically defensible, it's arguable, it's everything they're looking for in that prompt. Okay? In our next video, we're going to talk about contextualization. For those of you who watched earlier ones, I mentioned that contextualization and thesis should happen in the same place structurally on your essay. So this is important. This is why we're doing it next. Um, don't worry about the order of things on that rubric. We're going to tackle all of them and hopefully these will become helpful for you. Please send me your samples. I'll give you feedback. Let me know what questions you have about thesis writing. It's going to take you a lot of practice though, my friends. And if you don't practice, I promise you it's less likely that you're going to be successful. Remember, if you're timing this, you get about 40 minutes for the LEQ. I suggest a couple minutes just to brainstorm and, and plan, and then about three to five minutes to write that thesis that we were talking about. Because it's the most important part, you do want to spend some time in it, but you don't want to spend an inordinate or unfair amount of time on that. Okay, people, that's all we have time for right now. Until next time, just remember, life is about choices. We'll see you next time.